Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, Episode 4, Season 2. So, last season on the show, we had several guests mention uh, Korean natural farming, also very commonly referred to as KNF, but we never really dove into it. And so I wanted to give Korean natural farming a little bit more explanation and airtime because I think that this approach to agriculture, which today's guest, Chris Trump, will explain beautifully and presently, has a lot of potential for creating our own on-farm fertility, for pest management and disease management, and working with indigenous microorganisms. Chris was my own personal entry into KNF through his YouTube series. So I really wanted to have him on. Chris grew up on a conventional macadamia nut farm in Hawaii that is now managed primarily with KNF techniques. So we'll talk about that whole process of conversion because I think it really shed some light on the real world potential for KNF. This was a thorough and thought provoking conversation. And don't worry, we also get into some very specific applications of KNF for annual market gardening as well. Uh, some, in fact, if you're a KNF follower that I had never heard of. But first, one simple request from me. If you like the show and want to see it keep growing, please share it. Any episode at all, that's it. Email it to a friend, share it on your Instagram stories right now while you're listening to it, post it to your favorite Facebook groups. It doesn't even have to be a farming group. Everybody loves no-till agriculture. That's a fact. I looked it up on Snopes. Also, be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're getting it uh, so you do not miss an episode and have to be the only one at the coffee shop not talking about it. So embarrassing. So, yes, give it a share. That helps us out. Anyway, that's enough for me for now. Let's get to our amazing interview with Chris Trump of naturalfarming.co. Chris Trump, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jesse. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, and glad to have you. So I was hoping, you know, that maybe since the majority of this conversation will kind of center around Korean natural farming, uh, that you could kind of just give us a basic definition of what KNF is, how it started, and also why you don't call it KNF. <laughs> yeah, man, that's, uh, that's easy. Um, so... I do. I, I call it natural farming um, mostly because it's only us Americans that call it uh, Korean natural farming. Um, and so um, I, I have had a bunch of interaction and continue to with the broader natural farming community. So there's a huge group in India, um, giant iteration in Thailand, um, Taiwan, Japan, uh, China. Um, and, uh, and, and several other places in the world. And, and for, you know, and, and a lot of these places, especially in the Asian countries, um, natural farming is as much a Japanese thing, um, as it is a Korean thing. Um, the kind of iteration we have right now, um, came, uh, and really was, made elegant by a man named Cho Han Yu. Um, and uh, he's often called Master Cho. And that's just a term of, of teacher, kind of like in Japan, you'd say sensei. Um, and yeah, so natural farming uh, is um, a, a bringing together of a lot of enzymatic theory from Japan and things that have been passed down for you know, hundreds of years in farming, um, but were really uh, brought together into an elegant method um, in Korea in this last kind of uh, generation of natural farming. So the, um, yeah, the conversations, when you go to Korea, you don't say Korean natural farming. Um, you just talk about natural farming. So that's probably habit as uh and uh, at the same time, I know it can be helpful for people to kind of know what you're talking about um, if you say Korean natural farming. But yeah, I've, I've settled on natural farming um, mostly for that communication with the international community. Yeah, it's um, Korean natural farming is not like the end all, you know, uh, agricultural uh, plan or method in my mind. And by any means, and uh, really, the the basic concept of natural farming 
is that you use how nature is already functioning. Um, so you come alongside and work with um, what nature already provides um, to farm effectively. And that can sound, uh, I, I, I grew up on a commercial farm, and so that can sound kind of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, small-scale thinking or uh, kind of like philosophical farming. Um, and it's not, it's, it's really, it's scalable and commercially viable. Um, and, uh, and it has a lot to do with working with how nature mines nutrients from the soil using microbial life, how indigenous microbial life is, um, actually preferred as it self perpetuates. So Korean natural farming is a, yeah, it's a beautiful way to take nature's provided um, and thriving microbial communities um, help get established in your commercial um, production, you know, farmland, and then using um, kind of really what we're experiencing in the scientific community is cutting edge technology um, to grow crops. So one of the things that's kind of fun right now is uh, the some some cutting edge you know scientific communities are studying how to extract certain plant hormones and enzymes um, and biochemical um, aspects of you know a desert plant or a um, a hardy um, forest plant and they're they're kind of isolating these specific properties that they find are really the strength. Why does this plant thrive in the desert in these harsh conditions? And they're mixing them into, uh, you know, a tonic to apply to plants to try and transfer these properties so that your plants thrive on the same level as what they're experiencing in these, you know, hardy or robust plants. And it's working. They're getting uh, responses in plants that boost their, you know, uh, drought tolerance or increase um, fruit production and, and all these different things. And uh, it's, it's really fun, but this is expensive tech. This is stuff that they're charging a ton for as a, they're making it, you know, copywriting and proprietary mixes and all of this. Well, in natural farming, you use uh, fermentation and uh, observation to accomplish this, really this exact same um, direction of, of use of uh, plant growth hormones and, and beneficial biochemicals. And so you're using stuff like fermented plant juice, we call SPJ, so that we don't have a mouthful every time we speak about these things. But um, And you're taking its new growth tips and you're getting uh, a transfer and an actual effect of um, beneficial biochemicals and plant growth hormones um, on in the kind of foliar uptake or soil drench uptake of uh, these nutrients you're creating inexpensively uh, using natural farming. So the core the core idea is working with nature to be highly productive and, and hopefully very profitable because. That is a reasonable and uh, good goal for a farmer. Um, well, at the same time, um, you don't have all your costs in your input. So, yeah, it's it's fun. That's an amazing, yeah, that's a great rundown. And I was really, I had it on my list to ask you about different innovations. Um, I'm not ready to get into <laughs> to FBJ just yet because I really kind of want to know you growing up on a commercial farm. Where did this sort of natural farming into the picture for you? When did that happen, and what was that like? Yeah, that was fun. I I um, largely credit my um, father uh, Jim Trump for that beginning, um, and a man named David Squirt. There's actually three guys: Doctor Park, Doctor Hoon Park, uh, a Korean uh, American uh, pediatrician lives in Hilo, Hawaii, um, my dad, and uh, 
this uh, future Farmers of America advocate in uh, Kohala on the Big Island named David Cortez. Um, I had uh, returned, got married, and returned to the farm uh, after college and was working. Um, uh, we built a commercial aquaponic system to explore crop diversity um, in our um, uh, farm, in our uh, macadamia nut farm, and we were producing. Uh, it was a small. It wasn't very big. We we had plans and laid out a pretty massive aquaponic system that we were going to build for um, production of lettuce. Actually, we were producing uh, baby romaine. Uh, seed that Bambi, uh, called Bambi that Johnny Seed puts out. And, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. I built it, um, worked with some of the aquaponics community in Hawaii. And, uh, we were producing about a hundred pounds a week of a baby romaine. Um, but at the scale we were at, which was just experimental for us, we were, um, just kind of breaking even. Ran the numbers, penciled it all out, and we looked at uh, what we did. And because our it's a little over 700 acres of uh, macadamia nut, because that's so big, um, it's all we had to do was you know we're we're looking at these these changes and adding a bunch of employees in this massive facility, and uh, it was kind of like if we just do macadamia nut like 10% better, we'd beat anything we do in this whole venture with all its risks and time. And, um, and it was kind of a, um, interesting because as we're asking that question, I got introduced to natural farming. Um, Dr. Hoon Park uh, was a pediatrician in Kilo for 40 years, uh, over 40 years. And um, his story is that as Natural farming, or sorry, forgive me, as um, he went through his practice, he said medicine got better and better and better. We had all this incredible advancements in medicine. He said but health got worse and worse and worse over the 40-something years of his practice. And uh, he said he, he was grieved by this just observation, and um, he began a journey to explore why, what's happening. And that took him to Korea, where he went to a conference, um, and it was just farmers, and they were packed in a, a warehouse building with dirt floors, and it was standing room only. And these men, primarily, some women, um, stood there for uh, 11 hours a day like weekends um, and listen to this man Cho Han Yu speak, Master Cho speak about natural farming. And these are, these are real farmers. So they're, they're sacrificing, uh, you know, probably all the free time they had to do the, this conference. And, um, and he talked about, you know, nutrient density and food. And then, uh, Dr. Park experienced the difference of this food that was being produced this way. And uh, so he came back, started a conversation um, in uh, Hawaii with uh, University of Nations, which is a YWAM um, group, and, um, and with this man, David Fortes, um, who was trying to revive future farmers of America in Hawaii. And, um, and they brought over uh, Master Cho. And so he came in 2008. My dad attended that. And um, that was about when I had just come back to Hawaii. And, um, and then uh, Master Cho came back again in 2010 or 11 and taught a five-day intensive with his daughter um, and kind of went through natural farming. I had sat in with Dr. Park trying to explain this or explaining this in um, Kona, and uh, he got heckled by lifetime farmers as he started explaining how to transplant a tree by cutting the taproot and letting it uh, dry out for a day and then putting it in nutrients to soak them up and then planting it. And uh, 
people people lost their stuff. And uh, Dr. Park is not a farmer, so he was just kind of passing on information. It was uh, it wasn't very pretty. And uh, I left there with you know a ton of questions, and then um, got to go to Korea, see some of this stuff, ask a lot of these questions, and uh, hang out with Master Cho in Hawaii, which was pretty miraculous. So I'm you know our town is 40 minutes from the nearest stoplight. And, uh, we're, you know, yeah, we're macadamia nut farmers out there, but it's country. You probably don't, you think Waikiki and Hawaii Five-O when you think of Hawaii, but where we live, it's, it's kind of the boondocks, if you will. And, um, Master Show was in our town, uh, for this five-day training and came to our farm. And, you know, this was my introduction really. Um, and since then I've been to Korea, you know, 10 or 12 times and uh, spent a lot of time with these people and, and learning and uh, and then implementing. We're now 100% using Korean natural farming on our farm and uh, definitely not changing anytime soon. We're loving uh, what it is to farm this way. And did you see that 10% increase in crop yield? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so for for us as commercial farmers to kind of be open the, to this, we had a we had a unique experience where we uh, we lease our land, so we don't own it, and uh, we um, we have primarily two landowners kind of split, and one of the landowners, uh, the, some of the land was bought um, in the last twelve years, uh, thirteen years, and they. Um, they wanted it to be organic. And so as a farmer to have your landowner dictate that you're going organic, um, is difficult. Um, and, uh, and it was that, that was the case for us. Um, we farmed about 400 and, um, acres conventionally. And now we're farming about, uh, you know, 350, 375, uh, organically. And we struggled because our, our methods for organic were primarily, you know, kind of like conventional organic, if you will. Kind of the same thing you're doing with conventional except no herbicides and um, no, uh, you know, all your inputs need to be on reproved. So now we're, instead of shipping in, you know, chemical fertilizer um, as we need it, we're shipping in Omri fertilizer and um, making our own compost and um, playing around with compost teas. And we, we really did not um, approach profitability um, like we had on the conventional side. Um, we were struggling. Our trees were yellowing. And um, we had a, uh, an event happen. There's a pest in our industry called a green stink bug, a little beetle-looking guy. And um, they insert their mouth piece they have like a drill you can drill through the shell and they put some of their saliva into the uh the kernel and uh liquefy some of the kernel and then suck it out through a straw basically and uh, it makes a kernel um unsaleable and uh we had an 80 percent crop failure due to really unique and perfect storm of uh scenarios and environmental conditions for this test. And uh, that was, for us, it was kind of game over. Um, we, the business, we had to sell all of our equipment, um, all of our employees to be laid off. And uh, my dad's house was leveraged um, against the next crop here. And uh, they were gonna have to sell that and move to some lease land um, in the trailer. And that was that was our our real scenario. That's where we were, and uh, we had some um, crop insurance come in at the last kind of final hour, if you will, and um, it allowed my dad to keep his house and buy back um, a few pieces of equipment and hire a skeleton crew. But at this point, um, we can't farm all our all the acreage, and um, the organic was significantly less productive and profitable. So we were just farming the conventional side at that point. And uh, during uh, about 
four years of um, the organic being fallow, um, the trees greened up, the um, the nut production increased pretty significantly, and um, all these kind of conditions that were kind of the stressed orchard um, where we were applying great nutrients and, you know, really trying um, this, leaving it alone, it was better. And, um, you know, people don't do that with, it's a pretty young industry. People don't do that a lot with uh, macadamia nuts. And so it was, it began a journey for us, really, that, that whole scenario put a question in our head, which was, um, you know, what's going on here? We know some of the answers you get, you know, oh, well, you're taking off this much and you're putting, you need to put on this much. But we had kind of followed those protocols. Um, there was something kind of overall more that was occurring. And uh, so when natural farming came around and as we're exploring, um, I'm learning the aquatic um, uh, food web kind of microbial food web and and um, aquaponics we were pretty open to learning because we didn't in our conventional experts in our industry which i had the blessing of growing up hearing being in the conversations and listening to my dad talk with some really intelligent and uh, knowledgeable people um, there, there wasn't answers to this question. And so we were, um, when natural farming kind of arrived and I know I've probably a bit off the uh, question you just asked, but when natural farming arrived, we were really kind of already asking this question, like what's going on in a fallow system? There's more than just the nuts are creating fertilizer. Because our pigs, the pigs and our the wild pigs in our area were eating most of the nuts, so that wasn't uh, helping at all. But um, yeah, what Jesse, what were you uh, inquiring there right before I went into that story? No, I was just curious, like if you saw when you started those Korean natural farming, when you started using the right. supplements, if you were able to see that ten percent increase that you were sort of looking for. Yeah, so. We began with a 14 tree trial. Um, in this um, type of farming, in this natural farming stuff, we started pretty skeptical. Um, we thought that was our best service as farmers to the idea of natural farming. If it was any good, then it would be good with full skepticism, not as believers before we saw results. So, um, yeah, we um, we did a 14 tree trial, but at the same time, our commitment was we weren't going to kind of do it halfway. We weren't going to like have poor results just because um, I didn't really bother to follow the, you know, steps and do it properly. So we did a great job, you know, as far as the training goes and, and what we were given. A friend of mine, uh, Pancho Cam Pedro, helped me with that. He's, um, you know, Neil Young and Crazy Horse? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's he's Crazy Horse, so he's the uh, oh. the head of you know the the Crazy Horse band. So he was my farming buddy in Korean natural farming when I started this, and we're still good buddies. But he's he's got a beautiful property in Puiko. He he gardens and farms on doesn't farm on our farm anymore. But he was inspired that um, that the world could change, you know, with uh, you know a large farm kind of seeing these things and and the results. So we got we played around. We did a 14 tree trial and uh, picked a diverse group of trees, some that were pretty diseased with something we call um, uh, macadamia quick decline or macadamia slow decline, which is um, a root borne fungal disease called Phytophthora, um, and it's uh, it's basically a parasitic fungus that makes relationships with tree roots and um, you know, the tree dies within a few years. Um, it's a it's a killer to production when tree density is a really big uh, big thing. So we have this 14 trees, and our our really healthy trees got you could see them um, putting out new growth really nicely, and uh, 
even being really um, productive. You could you could see that, but it was incredibly visible with the disease trees. Um, with um, this disease, the trees um, defoliate and uh, generally are good for pushing over within um, within a couple of years. You don't get them back. There's not really a a solution to Phytophthora worldwide. Um, but we saw a refoliation within the first year and uh, back in production by the second year and even an increase or, or really a, um, a recovery and a, a growth in production by year three. And, uh, and that's not perfect or 100%. It's not, you know, there's, there's it's a big farm and there's pockets that are still struggling. You know, it isn't like, all our trees are 100% disease-free. I don't want to you know, paint an unrealistic picture. But in, in that 14-tree trial, all the disease trees did recover. And it was uh, pretty significant. So then we did a, a five-acre trial and then 50 acres. And then for about four years, we ran a 120-acre trial. Um, and we saw incredible results. And we did see... Um, production increase, and we got that 10%, and we were also reducing costs. Um, even with the increased cost um, and man man hours of mowing, because now we couldn't use herbicide, we saw um, an overall um, profitability increase on the acreage. And so now um, we're, I think, uh, orchard-wide, we're four years into natural farming. And um, that 120 acre is now um, a little over eight years into natural farming, and um, we'll, we're we're loving the results. We're completely organic certified, um, and um, yeah, we we had uh, two years ago. Uh, this last year was a huge rain event, um, and. Uh, great production, but it was really hard to get in the orchard and harvest it because we used mechanical harvesters, so it wasn't as good a profitability year, but the year before that, we had um, profitability that um, was was more than the uh, 28 years combined before that, so it was um, definitely is uh, working for us in dollars and cents. Hey, you all, just jumping in here real quick to get a word from our amazing show sponsors like BCS America. You already know about the legendary versatility of BCS two-wheel tractors on the small farm. You know it's the most economical and time-saving choice for market farmers, building beds with the rotary plow, mixing amendments with the power harrow, and mowing cover crops with the flail mower. But a BCS two-wheel tractor can do much more beyond the small farm. BCS powers more than 40 high-quality PTO-driven attachments, each with the power and performance of an all-gear drive transmission. Blow snow with BCS's snow thrower, also known as the snow cannon. Chip and shred debris with the chipper shredder. Clean your property with a pressure washer. Irrigate your lawn or garden with the high-pressure irrigation pump. Haul over 800 pounds, including yourself, with a rideable utility trailer. And now, spread compost evenly over 30-inch beds with the all-new spreader attachment. Yep. BCS is pretty much the Swiss Army knife of power equipment. Check out bcsamerica.com for the latest attachments, videos, promotions, and more. That's bcsamerica.com. The show is also generously supported by Farmer's Web. Farmer's Web software makes it easier for your farm to manage working with your buyers. By lessening the administrative load and increasing efficiency, Farmer's Web helps you save time, reduce errors, and work with more buyers overall. Our free account includes features to manage your real-time and coming soon product availability and tools to create your own availability calendar to inform buyers of the seasonality of your products. The free account also includes access to the Farmer's Web Guide to Working with Wholesale Buyers, which offers pro tips and best practices on how to work with restaurants, schools, and other similar buyers. A one-month free trial is available of the paid account, which includes features to manage your customers and orders, Give select buyers special pricing and payment terms, track your buyer's payments, send invoices, keep detailed sales records, and much more. You can even manage orders for buyers who don't place them online. Access a demo video and learn more at FarmersWeb.com. All right, big thanks to our show sponsors. Back to Chris. Now that we've kind of touched on it, 
um, you know, its efficacy, at least its potential, I'd love, and it's a huge subject. So there's, there's a lot to cover and you've done some really great videos. So I can, I'm, I'm definitely going to point people to those to get some more knowledge, but I want to talk about some kind of specific things. And I know the one that really stands out when we talk about natural farming is the indigenous microorganism collection. Um, so maybe we mm -hmm. can start there. What is the value of collecting one's own IMOs? And then we'll talk maybe just about how one goes about doing that. Sure. Yeah. There really isn't natural farming without indigenous microorganism, that, that whole process. Um, you see that I've kind of witnessed people kind of playing around with just some of the inputs you can make. And uh, I think it's really possible to have benefit with those uh, alone. But really the, the beauty and um, core of natural farming is this. IMO um, process. And so, yeah, so indigenous microorganism, um, indigenous is pretty central and key to the whole concept. So the idea is that if I'm um, farming in the desert in California and somebody brings me over a bunch of leaf litter and mycelium from the rainforest in Hawaii, um, it's not going to do so well. Or maybe it will while I'm watering it and, you know, producing my crop. Maybe it will for five, six months, but it'll die off and I'll have to reapply and only maybe some of it will thrive. Um, the idea with indigenous microorganism is you're taking um, microbial life from your wild environment. So you're, you're going out into the area, generally same climate or um, temperate zone and uh, you're collecting these microbes that exist in the forest and and ideally an untouched or uh, an area that hasn't been disturbed in a pretty long time as long as possible and you're collecting a thriving micro ecosystem so the um, the balance has already been established it's it's there and things are working together. So that um, collection now coming to your farm, going on your shelf, because you can cause it to go dormant, especially the yeast and the, the fungi, because they sporulate in low water conditions. So you, you're mixing it with a, a certain amount of sugar, kind of like the concept of, um, think about a long sea voyage, and uh, they would take fish. And in order to keep fish in a, without refrigeration, they would stick it in salt. And that worked um, in those, you know, in days without other preserving methods um, because the salt was dry. It had a, a dryness, um, also known as, a, as an osmotic pressure. It pulled the moisture that would try and get close to the fish um, out of the the environment so it's effectively a water desert um, where the fish is now microbes in order to rot things or decompose need water molecules so in the same way we use this concept with sugar where we take a collection of microbial life and we um, kind of put it in cryofreeze so to speak cause the fungi to sporulate by putting it in a low water environment um, and that causes uh, it to be shelf stable so now we have a collection of microbial life um, on our shelf that's basically the farmer's own indigenous and nearly free inoculum um, so that for me that I can have a shelf stable and usually you're collecting spring, summer, fall um, collection. So you have maybe two years worth of spring, summer, fall on your shelf and you mix them all to use them for um, going on to the next stage. But for me, that, that idea that a farmer can pretty easily, there's a learning curve as far as just technique, but pretty easily have their own indigenous inoculum to use in their processes on their farm you know, for composting, et cetera, 
that's really the strength of natural farming. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful strength and there's a lot more to it, but um, that's pretty special. So let me just give you my understanding of it and then you can correct any spaces, but we're, in order to get these these indigenous microorganisms, what you're doing is you're steaming rice and you're putting it into a box that has some sort of breathability. Um, and then you're covering that box with something that also is sort of porous, like a cloth that will allow microbes. You don't want to cover it with plastic. In other words, you want something that can pass through it. You're setting that in the forest, uh, pre preferably something old growth. And on that rice is growing the microorganisms which you then collect and add sugar to is that kind of did i miss anything there does that kind of sum it up yeah that's a great summary of kind of the process of of doing that and you go into yeah. great detail you do a whole video about it that i think is absolutely worth watching because there's a lot of nuance there um yeah and and people people ask about oh why rice that's not indigenous to my area and, you know, shouldn't I use some other grain um, or some other, because it, it's basically an auger. You think of we're kind of taking, we're making like a Petri dish situation, um, so to speak. But a Petri dish is um, primarily a, a sugar um, and kind of an easy sugar to process, but not all microbes, that's not every microbe's favorite food. And um, in natural farming, it's really easy to get bacteria in everything we're doing. Um, it's, I, my, my phrase I like to use is that you can sneeze and have bacteria in natural farming. It's, it's easy. It comes uh, passively. But really what we're going for is the larger hypodiander fungi. And those guys, um, in my kind of journey, experimenting, observation, um, and research, those guys actually thrive on and eat um, plant fats. The, the, um, they break apart amino acids in the plant cell walls and then process, you know, the other fats that uh, are made um, in, in the plant kingdom. And that, um, is where the rice comes in. So rice has one of the highest fat, pro the best fat profiles of any grain or really easy to kind of prep material you could use for something like this. So yes, bacteria can thrive on them also. Um, but really, if bacteria goes nuts on your rice culture, um, you throw it out because you start liquefying your rice and it gets really gnarly and nasty. So it, it's really... Um, most everything you're doing in the whole IMO process is aimed at some of these um, fungal and yeast um, type uh, microbes. Interesting. Yeah, it's funny that you that you mentioned that about a lot of people and rice in terms of not you know it's not indigenous to that area because last year we had Elaine Ingham on Dr. Elaine Ingham on the podcast. And that was one of the things I asked her about KNF, and she'd mentioned um, that she was a little skeptical at the time about uh, using rice as a substrate. And I kind of was curious to hear what you were, what your feelings were on that. But I hadn't heard anything about the fat um, in terms of being yeah. able to collect a wider range of of fungi, of beneficial fungi. Yeah, Dr. Elaine is is somebody that I've um, in my whole journey. Um, really am grateful for is that she, she connected the key for me. Um, in natural farming, one of the things that we didn't have or I didn't understand was uh, fungal to bacterial ratios in soil. And so right as I'm digging into and uh, getting my bearings on creating an ideal product for our farm as far as IMO goes, um, David Fuertes, this wonderful FAA, FFA um, advocate, brought in Dr. Landingo, again, from my tiny town in Kohala. And she taught me the microscope, broke down fungal to bacterial ratio, 
And it was a real important key for me in that journey to um, be able to check my work. I bought a microscope immediately um, and spent a uh, better part of a couple of years um, orienting myself and, and training my eyes to, to know what I'm looking at and to be able to assess my work. And I would um, calibrate that and by sending away to bio labs, I'd take a sample, I'd assess it, I'd write down my assessment, send it away to a bio lab and see kind of where it was. And uh, that ended up being wonderfully helpful. So yeah, she's, she's wonderful. And I talked with her a lot this year um, about some of this stuff. And uh, it's, yeah, when I, when I was talking to her back in, I think it was 2011 um, that I learned the microscope from her. Um, she, she wasn't super, uh, she didn't talk a lot about inoculum, but now she'll encourage people to go to the local forest and grab some stuff or if they're on a hike, stick it in their pocket and bring it to their compost pile. And, uh, so I think, uh, I think natural farming, uh, rubbing off on her, but (laughs) the, uh, um, the, the thing is in, in their, uh, in her studies, um, they would take oats and stick them in a hole in the forest and try and see what they could collect them. So it's kind of funny because that oats is actually another grain that has an incredibly, uh, nice fat profile. It's my, uh, it's my new favorite thing to produce the next stage, this IMO3 um, on. So I get crimped oats um, because it's inexpensive. It's available in the middle of the country, and um, it has a great fat profile. Not anywhere near as good as rice, but way better than a wheat um, or, or barley or some of these other options. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. How do you know when you're collecting these IMOs that you're getting beneficial and not pathogenic organisms? Like what's, are there things that people can do without a microscope to be able to know those, to know that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So one of the, one of the ways is as you walk out into the forest to choose a place to do a collection, you're looking for uh, a visible fungal body. which is also called a mycelium, um, you know, bloom. Um, you're looking for these strands. They kind of look like spider webs, but they're much thicker. And so you're looking for these strands of um, fungal bodies, and hopefully you find a place where they're just going ballistic. They're all over the place, and you can just nestle your rice right in there, tuck a little into the rice or around the cloth, and these fungal spores will uh, move on into this wonderful food you set out um, and bloom there. But the, the cool thing is you don't need a microscope to find beneficials and to be sure you found the beneficial. If you found a fungal body that you can see with your naked eye, meaning you can discern a single strand, um, that is an, at least four micrometers wide um, because uh, the human eye can't discern anything uh, smaller than four micrometers as far as an individual strand. It starts looking just like fuzz to us. Um, so all disease-causing fungi um, that we know of are 1.5 micrometers or smaller. So with that um, assessment tool of knowing, wow, I found these big visible strands um, I know I have a, a bloom beneficial my, microbial life, beneficial fungi, and uh, getting that to cultivate my rice um, and grow out, and then watching that kind of bloom on the following stages of this IMO process and seeing these individual strands uh, is really fun. And yeah, now I know I have uh, a culture of some of these big guys that are really responsible for doing a lot of the wonderful work on a vegetable farm or, uh, you know, a commercial, you know, farming scenario, because uh, most of our crops like uh, at least a balanced fungal to bacterial ratio, or in in a lot of cases, they like more fungi than bacteria other than the rest. So, yeah, we're, um, 
we're able to at least have a, a cursory um, understanding of what we're looking at, even though we, yeah, if you don't have a mic, which is fun. Yeah, that's that's great. I think the the microscope is definitely the next level for a lot of people. Um, but I like that there are ways to do it without necessarily owning one. So, Jesse, one, one other thing that um, I think is um, maybe underestimated, um, but I think is an incredible scientific tool that everybody has, is our noses. Um, the, 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 the olfactory sense um, center sits right on our um, cerebral cortex. And um, it actually bypasses memory. It has its own memory, so to speak. Um, so I had a, a microbiologist teacher in, uh, in college. Um, he's the, it was a small private school in, in Southern California, but he was the head microbiologist for Azusa. And uh, he, I guess I'll tell the backstory. So he had a girlfriend in college that um, broke up with him. And she slapped him in the face on his right cheek uh, in, in this falling out that they had in college. And so he's, he's like 20 years later, he's walking with his wife and Macy. And uh, the right side of his face starts to burn. And he's like, what's going on? And he realized that he's smelling the fragrance that his girlfriend in college wore. He's smelling her perfume. And he's having a physiological response to the memory of that slap. Um, this is all subconscious. Our noses are incredible scientific tools. And so um, just getting a feel for when things smell off. Um, I mean, I, I don't really even need my microscope nowadays on my pile. I know exactly what I've got based on smell. And there's a little bit of training in that for my nose. But uh, the nose knows. So, for example, if I'm wanting to produce a bunch of beneficial fungi that's uh, diverse and everything kind of has the chance to grow out pretty evenly and I start to smell a ton of ammonia, I know I'm probably running away with a monoculture of an actinobacteria of some sort um, because it's just my temperature. I know I'll look for another marker. If that's happening, my temperature will spike to 140. And um, for for me and what I'm trying to accomplish, I know I've kind of lost my target, and that that I know I can know as soon as I walk into the room where I or into the area where I'm producing this, I know, uh oh, something's wrong here. And so I think, uh, yeah, our nose becomes a pretty useful tool. Yeah, that's great. I I'm obsessed with the olfactory center. <laughs> it's it's so amazing to you know, uh, just the, all, all the things that the nose can do. I worked in wine for a long time, so it became a kind of an obsession of mine, but, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's it, without our olfactory senses, we can't even taste. It's a, it's a right. really extraordinary sense, but yeah, so that, that's, that's a great addition, Chris. I appreciate that. Hey, you all, one last interruption for me. If you are enjoying this episode or any episode, consider signing up to be a patron of this show at patreon.com slash farmer Jesse. That's P A T R E O N. Certainly some of you have been meaning to do it and you just haven't yet and that's cool, but that Patreon page is what keeps this show and all the no-till info we collect over at notillgrowers.com going uh, and growing. We really appreciate that support. You can also just kick us a few bucks over at Venmo to no -till, to at no-till growers uh, just to say thanks for the show. But if you go to the Patreon route, there are discounts to events, early access, uh, and at certain levels, a shout out on this podcast. So big shout outs this week to Dawson Mahalko of Jubilant Field Farms, Tiffany Jackson of McHaven Farm, and Jane Fortier of the Market Gardener Masterclass. Much love to you all. Thank you so much for your support. All right, back to Chris. So I want to talk a little bit about local adaptation uh, in terms of a lot of the stuff that you read about in Korea, natural farming is based on tropical environments, um, using tropical plants, banana leaves, uh, cinnamon, and there are things that we can grow here, maybe in tunnels, but there are others that we can't. Are there, what kind of tips do you have for locally adapting um, some of these, these preparations? 
Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, and I apologize for that. You know, um, I recognize that there's uh, the information does need to increase for for all the all the mainland farmers. Um, yeah, the so the reason for a lot of that literature being about tropically available um, resources is because that's where this um, method of farming landed was in. In, on the Big Island of Hawaii, and so um, you know, a lot of the experimentation, um, things that were done through college, was through the University of Hawaii, and um, and with you know locally available things. Um, but yeah, the the place where this came from, um, this kind of current iteration of natural farming is from Korea, and Korea has a whole gambit of um, season and uh is much more like the the midwest than it is like hawaii so um yeah there's a lot of options um the idea with um plants for spj for example that's a lot of people are like i don't have bananas here you know how do i get that they're watching me play around in you know tropical environment um you're looking for so FPJ, again, it's fermented plant juice, and it's basically a plant food. Think of it as a um, highly um, available nutrient that uh, plants can take up through their leaves, um, but kind of like a liquid compost, if you will, like a boutique liquid compost. It's it's like a, a plant food in liquid form, but you're also focusing on collecting these beneficial um, biochemicals and plant growth hormones, um, and, and using them to help your plants grow and give your plant signal. Um, but yeah, as far as what we can use right now, I'm walking, uh, down the path and it's springtime or actually we're in summer now. And, uh, and there's this bush here of blackberry and you can see right, right at the tip there's just this like beautiful, um, soft, bright green leaves of the tip, uh, the growing tip of this blackberry bush. And there's tons of it. It's all over. And then there's these berries, these green berries that are just getting ready to, um, you know, start turning into sugars, but they aren't there yet. Right now, this giant bush is taking all of its energy from all these big, dark green, giant leaves in the back and and borders of this bush and they're pushing it into these new growing tips these bright green tender shoots and these um these growing berries so you can come out here and just with a you know a scissor or something whack all of it you know in all kinds of wild environment and uh um shred it up you know, with a, with a knife or scissors and um, mix it with sugar. And that'll produce a liquid that would be incredibly potent for, um, for plant food. And, um, and then, but there's, that's, that's just an example. And it's a food type example, but really the only thing you don't want to be using is something that's poisonous. Um, Like, Hem, you know, hemlock or, you know, something like that. You want to steer clear of those because we are applying this all to food. But um, rose hips, for example, or comfrey, or I love rhubarb in Idaho because you can have some of it on the farm and it just goes nuts all by itself. You can go and whack all of the uh, growing areas of that and you have a ton of juice and, and uh, really abundant. But really what you want to do is turn off your eyes of this is really hard to grow and produces a ton of profit when I take it to market and turn on your eyes of what is the thing that grows in my area that is always beautiful. The bugs leave it alone and it's free, you know, that, that looks healthy all the time. Um, Nobody takes care of it or waters it and it's just abundantly, you know, um, prolific and healthy um, because that plant is effectively mining the nutrients in your soil, is effectively converting um, the soil to um, uh, dense nutrients in its body and able to basically 
Um, it's a healthy plant. It's not going to be anemic or, you know, all these things. Um, that's what you want to collect for, you know, like an STJ and et cetera. Um, yeah, so, so there's, there's definitely the options. The reason this works worldwide and that we have connection with all these international communities doing natural farming is it's not based on some, you know, isolated available resource. Um, it's really based on use what you have. And in Hawaii, we, uh, we have a version of English that's pidgin English. It's actually Hawaiian pidgin is an official language now. But um, use what get is uh, something that a friend of mine says, you know, it's, it's basically, what do you have around you? That's, that's the thing that's your, your resource in natural farming. Yeah, that's cool. So it's kind of like what you were talking about in terms of the, in the very beginning about the, you know, using the high tech, the new technology to extract those, you know, uh, plants that are surviving perhaps extreme conditions and using that to apply those to other plants. Uh, it's kind of the low tech version of that. Yeah. yeah to cool. do that, what, what they're doing, you, you want to be able to, um, trademark that and to trademark that you're, you're going to spend a bunch of money, but to just use your power of observation and basically benefit from it, it's cheap. Yeah, that's great. So one more I want to talk to you about is lactic acid bacteria, uh, often called LAB, and how some sort of practical applications for that, just kind of trying to bring it into, you have a vegetable garden, what are some ways that KNF is, could be beneficial to you beyond adding the indigenous microorganisms, but things like those little preps, like the FPJ, the FFJ, and then uh, the lactic acid bacteria. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, um, that's a that's a cool and also um, easy input to make the, in a kind of natural farming suite of tools. Um, one of the things that I'm working on and um, is going to be more and more available is really the application of all these parts of natural farming. It gets somewhat complex, and I've I've hesitated teaching it outside of a five-day class where you're given the whole picture. But um, I, I did create a, a kind of a video um, online that um, on my website that you can kind of get a introduction to bringing these components together and when to apply them uh, on your farm. And that's, that's really what's, what's needed more and more. So I'm working on that. And, uh, Raising five kids and farming a couple farms, so that's uh, that's coming. But yeah, LAB is um, has a small role in natural farming, um, but really is a wonderful thing that everybody should have in their tool belt. I think as farmers, um, it's incredibly effective for uh, livestock farmers. So if you're raising uh, chickens or um, uh, hogs or uh, even cattle um, can be really, really helpful. Um, one of the ways you can use uh, natural farming, if you do have uh, pasture, you know, if you are raising cattle, is um, you can take um, LAB uh, at a rate of 1 to 700, SPJ at a rate of 1 to 300, and um, Seawater uh, diluted at a rate of one to uh, twenty-five, and you mix those and and leave them uh, kind of mingled for at least twenty-four hours. But it keeps longer than that, and you just spray this really simple nutrient um, on your grassland. Um, it's crazy cheap, um, and this will um, sweeten your grass. So cattle. You know, if you're if you have a little bit of um, maybe grass that's kind of a little uh, harder, you know, maybe the the cattle avoid it because it's older. Um, it'll sweeten it and they'll eat it. Um, also, it'll add fertility and, and the general mineral to your um, grassland. And you can get a lot of uh, 
production increase, believe it or not, with this really, really simple um, kind of input technology. We call that fermented seawater. Um, and that you can use on anything, truthfully. You don't want to... Um, you don't want to use... Actually, yeah, you can use that even pretty close to harvest. But um, LAB is something that is a huge um, part of the kind of whole food web. So like in the human body, for example, um, we have a, a ton of microbial life in our gut system. And uh, we're outnumbered about 10 to 1 um, human cell to microorganism cells. And uh, they have much smaller cells. So um, that's how that works without us looking like a microorganism. But the, um, 70% of those microorganisms are this kind of lactobacilli family microbial life. And so in, in a human body, um, to this LAB, I have a video on how to make it. I feed it to my kids. I feed it to my dog. I feed it to my chickens. And uh, I take it regularly because it's just a wonderful uh, supplement to our, our food system. Soon part that guy I talked about in the beginning, um, he has Crohn's disease. And for the last um, seven years, he's been asymptomatic, meaning he has Crohn's disease, which is incurable, but he doesn't suffer any of the symptoms because he takes LAB with every meal. Um, and so he's an actual pediatrician, you know, a PhD, and he, instead of prescribing a bunch of things to, to gut health patients, he teaches them how to make their own LAB, and uh, it's it's really cool. So if you ever travel with Dr. Park, he's got a little bottle of LAB with him, and he pours it in some water at every meal. Um, but, uh, yeah, so same thing with our animals. Um, if you have chickens, one way to get about a 20% uh, um, kind of uh, uh, feed um, production, um, increase effect without increasing your feed buff is to wet their food 24 hours before and apply LAB. This also works for pigs and other single gastric animals. Uh, this wonderful university or this university in India did a wonderful study on uh, single gastric animals and feed. And while keeping the same feed, they um, uh, uh, fed these animals just their dry feed and with a um, same feed just wetted before they fed it to them they had a carcass an overall carcass um, quality increase of about 10 to 20 percent and by adding water plus a um, microbial life this lab um, they had a another 20 percent carcass quality increase um, and this was a very thorough peer review study um, and so we, especially as Americans, we have almost no ferments in our diet. And so as, um, you know, whereas other cultures, almost every meal has a, a you know, a kimchi or a sauerkraut or um, a miso soup or, you know, all these different types of ferments that are found all over the place. Um, so, yeah, we can really benefit just human health. But then plant-wise, it's a soil conditioner. You can use it as a soil drench. Um, it can help with, um, if you get some uh, certain diseases, it can help. Um, some, some people have a great deal of success treating powdery mildew with um, uh, LAB, like 1 to 500, 1 to 1,000 dilution, just sprayed on, because it's a very strong microbe that can beat other microbes out for um, kind of territory or usable space. Yeah, Jesse, the, the one thing, I, I mean, a lot of this is, is pretty complex and there's, there's a lot of different things you can do to uh, add benefit to your farm using natural farming. Um, one of the simplest things is uh, um, called a maintenance solution or SES. And it's a real kind of easy on-ramp to playing with this stuff, even if you don't want to get into the learning curve of IMO and it's um, brown rice vinegar. So you just go to your 
local restaurant surplus or Costco or something, get a rice vinegar. It doesn't have to say brown rice vinegar. And then OHN. OHN is kind of hard because it, it takes some time to make, but there's a real easy video on it. If you don't want to make it, you want to just buy a little bit so you can start playing with it. Um, I sell some on my website, but it's, um, and then FPJ and FPJ is really easy to make. It's, it's low hanging fruit as far as stepping into this. Um, but that mixture, FPJ is used at a rate of one to 500, which is a ratio. So figure if you have two, uh, one liter, you would add two ML. That's a one to 500. And then OHN is used at a rate of one to a thousand. Um, and, uh, so that's one ML per liter and then brown rice vinegar is used at a rate of one to 500. And what this is, is the SBJ becomes, it's a food, um, and, uh, has beneficial biochemicals. Um, OHN is a prebiotic or, um, helps with, uh, increase, uh, plant immune system. And then brown rice vinegar, um, helps to, um, micronize the water particle and, um, kind of sour the sweetness of the SPJ um, to create a balanced food. It's, it just it helps with ease uptake for a plant um, and uh, has its own beneficial properties because it's a grain vinegar. Um, but you can use this to increase germination with seeds. So you soak your seeds and then plant them. Soak them for about one to two hours, um, depending on seed size. Smaller seeds, shorter time. Larger seeds, longer time. And then if you're using a mechanical feeder, you, you can soak them and then screen dry them uh, just for, you know, a few hours till the end so that they slide in your feeder really easily. But maintenance solution, you can apply once a week. It's really easy. You apply, you don't want to apply it in the heat of the day. You don't want to fold your feed in the heat of the day, but um, you can get a ton of benefit just by spraying that once a week. Do that um, in addition to stuff you're already doing. And you can get a production increase and uh, disease resistance, and that's really inexpensive. There's there's almost no cost um, to doing that. And um, yeah, I I think mean solutions are great kind of entry point for people. And then with if you start kind of playing with that and enjoy it, one way you can kind of see if it's working is you can uh, do it on half your crop. You know, once a week on half of it, and see what kind of uh, difference if it's worth your time. And then um, once you have that, if you're kind of into that, um, you can start adding in some of these other components. FAA, fish amino acid, is a nitrogen, a highly available, easy to take up foliarly nitrogen. Um, WCA is a water-soluble calcium that can be taken in foliarly. And uh, you can bring those in based on plant need. So observing your plant, knowing you need a little touch of nitrogen, you just add that to that maintenance solution, which your maintenance solution kind of becomes your base that you can then add a component or two as needed. That's cool. I, I hadn't heard about the maintenance solution. Yeah, that's uh, for seeds. It, it's pretty incredible. The amount, the percentage germination just by soaking them in this um, compared to water or anything else is, is great. Um, I, have, I have some students that have done some side by side. And uh, the benefit persists throughout the plant's life, um, which is kind of bonkers. Can you use this? Like, can you use it through irrigation? Like the yeah, the main yeah, thing? people yeah. fertigate it with it. Okay, so if you're not, for instance, like carrot seed, we probably wouldn't soak. So, is that something that you could run through your your irrigation system to get it down to the seeds? Definitely. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what it kind of does is a lot of those nutrients are a, uh, are microbial foods and buffers. So, um, new roots coming out with a, a little, um, saturation of these nutrients become, they, they're coming out with kind of something to bring to the table to create uh, root tip relationships with beneficial fungi and bacteria so that the root zones more quickly become um, places of exchange than maybe a slower process without that. Yeah, that's really cool. What, 
In terms of studies, I mean, has has KNF been backed up pretty well with the scientific literature, or is that coming? What is what's your feeling on that? Yeah, that's that's a pretty big hole. Um, initially in Hawaii, uh, we had a lot of difficulty because people had no idea what KNF was, but they needed a you know a master's thesis or or something like that. So they basically winged it, did everything wrong, and then wrote a paper about it. So that was that was pretty damning initially, just because um, if you take the same ingredients but mix them improperly, and you know, there's a lot of learning curve in this. Um, you can, yeah, it's it's not good. You know, you can get a bunch of stinky material and call it IMO. So um, a little bit of education in natural farming is helpful before we do uh, assessment of natural farming. But um, there's a bunch of great studies that have been done in um, Korea. There's a uh, Konkuk University. Um, uh, the head of the ag program there is Dr. Kim. Wonderful guy. He works a bunch with World Vision. And they basically, um, through a partnership, provide um, scholarships to the ministries of agriculture and up and coming um, kind of ag um, leadership of impoverished or struggling nations um, in agriculture. And uh, but they've done some great studies um, um, exploring even the use of metagenomics to um, assess soil microbial communities. But I think all in all, um, this type of use of um, the microbial world to produce crops is the cutting edge of science. This is the new frontier. Um, you know, you talk to microbiologists today and there's a lot of experts with a lot of knowledge and um, a lot of wonderful things we do know. But in reality, we understand like 0.3% of what goes on in the microbial world. Um, and most of that is what we learn through studying pathogens in, you know, human microbial settings. Um, we, we haven't even scratched the surface of studying beneficial soil microbials. And, um, and then in that, further in that, we have almost no idea on how these things work in community. So we have this um, method of studying microbial life um, kind of from, again, back from studying pathogens in human science um, where we isolate. We pull out one microbe, we cultivate it, and we study what it does. Um, but the problem with that as we now discover the incredible symphony that is the the soil food web, the the symphony of nature, um, we're finding all of this stuff works in community. None of it works in isolation, and so we might understand a little bit about what LAB does or some large hyphal diameter fungi, but we have almost no understanding of what it does in connection with um, uh, plant exudates plus yeast and bacteria and how all of them work in harmony and connectedness to um, basically do process. And that's where, yeah, natural farming uses all of that, but our scientific community can't quite explain that yet. Um, but that's where we're going. That's where, that's what everybody's studying. There's a lot of cool things being looked into. Just hope it doesn't get uh, the, you know, I hope we don't have a, a new generation of MMOs um, uh, or GMMOs, genetically modified microorganisms with a trademark on them. I hope this becomes just a, a world of exploration and growth for all of us. Well, Chris Trump, I thank you so much for your time. I've greatly enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, just thanks for good questions and, and conversation. And uh, yeah, 
it's fun. And thanks for all you're doing for the uh, no tail farming community. Blessing. Uh, absolutely. All right. If you enjoyed that episode, and I know you did, make sure to follow Chris on YouTube and Instagram and check out naturalfarming.co. He does a lot of educational stuff over there, and it's really amazing. He also sells a lot of the equipment and some of the preparations you need for Korean natural farming. So go check that out. Also check out Island Harvest Hawaii. That's his family's macadamia nut company. I really love macadamia nuts, so feel free to send me to Hawaii so I can eat a handful. Anyway, don't forget to check out the event we have coming up in February 2020 in San Diego with Jared Smith of Jared's Real Food and Stephen Cornett of Nature's Always Right. It's going to be an all-day intensive with those two, um, and we're going to talk about no-till growing, and we're also going to see some of the plots that Jared is setting up in his cool sort of larger scale lasagna style. Um, and we talked about that last year on the podcast. We also spoke with Steven, so you can go listen to both of those episodes and check them out. It's super cool, and I'm sure we can get Steven to talk a little bit about KNF. So check that out. I'll be there. Jackson will be there. It'll be awesome. Notillgrowers.com. Click on the events tab. We'll put all sorts of links in the show notes, so you can also check that out. Don't forget to become a patron if you can at patreon.com slash farmer jesse, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash farmer jesse, j-e-s-s-e. Other than that, you all, thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Um, oh, interesting. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of, oh, cool, gardener snake. I should take that home. My kids would <laughs> love that. Sorry, I'm like strolling through the park and coming across wildlife. Nice. Uh, I can't. That would that would disrupt us. I think so. me trying to get that home. <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea. I love that image of you chasing a garter snake through the through the park, <laughs> <laughs> stuffing it in your pocket and taking it home. Oh uh, yeah, I'm gonna lick and be. He's probably happy here. <laughs>